What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And look, we have a great conversation um, for you today. We always do, straight up. I mean, honestly, shout out to the team. Shout out to our producers. Shout out to Aaron. Shout out to Mike. Shout out to our incredible guests. Um, you know, that's not really like I me. Mean, come on, like, come on. Like, if you, if you know, you know. Um, I, and shout out to the first time listeners. I know, right? Like we have people coming and going, but that's not why I'm really recording this rapper like this right now. That's not why I'm really doing this intro like this right now. I'm recording this because the landscape of quote unquote diversity, equity, and inclusion can send, continues to shift and change. Frankly, it continues to try to acquiesce to anti-black, anti-queer bigotry. At the center of all of the permutations that we've been experiencing since George Floyd's televised, or not televised, yeah, I'm going to say graphically recorded slaughter in 2020, it's been this weird dance where we, and by we, I mean DEI leaders have been trying to be bold, but at the same time cater to white sensitivity. So it started off extremely very, very in your face. We need to abolish whiteness and white supremacy culture and, and confront your privilege and, um, insert white liberal jargon here. And it was a lot of that, a lot of nonsense, to be honest, a lot of esoteric, theoretical, non-systemic, uh, non-tactical, transformational, non-real, non-tangible, intangible, <laughs> gobbledygook, side net talking, Bullshitting, to be honest, if we're going to be honest, right? A lot of white liberals um, invaded the space. And frankly, people that look like me who are trying to get some coins also um, were riding a wave. But at the same time, we're continuing to like seed ground slowly but surely to the loud majority that grew increasing, has grown increasingly resentful of the audacity of equity and has grown increasingly resentful at the audacity of black progress that has grown increasingly fearful and entitled to anything that would threaten the plunder that they have accumulated over the past several centuries. So again, it started off very bold with a bunch of grifters in there, people who look like me and and quite a few people that don't. And then it continued to seed and language continued to soften and actions continue to get more esoteric somehow, more intangible, less strategic, less tactical less real pair that with corporate executives who continue to do the calculus and understand that the PR bump that came from supporting the humanity of black people did not outweigh the risks of upsetting their largely white consumer bases. And you see where we are today. Now, there's been headlines of various DEI leaders exiting their posts and that's being manipulated a bit to make it seem as if those people were fired or whatever the case may be. When the reality is those folks are moving on anyway. Um, so that isn't the, 
the signal or the rallying cry that I think folks want it to be. The reality is, is that the DEI office has been getting hollowed out very aggressively for the past several years before the murder of George Floyd. It kind of got like a little bit of a, a little bit of a resuscitation for like a couple of months. But the reality is, is that these roles are becoming less and less central and seen as valued every single day. Their studies are already showing that the average retention of a, a DEI leader is about a year and a half. And I can tell you from personal experience, how many people that'll come on here to live in corporate on a, one of our shows and re- representing one brand. I reach out to them to have them back a year later. They're already gone to another brand or out of DEI as an industry altogether. They're, they're taking a sabbatical or they've, they're starting up their own shop or whatever the case is. The reality is that we sit in this moment now more than ever where people are going to have to make decisions as to what it is they stand for. And when I say people, I mean, DEI leaders, I mean, C-suite executives, I mean, thought leaders out here doing it through their own little LLCs or whatever the case is. People have to make us make a decision as to where they stand. This moment is real. We're seeing institutions upend 50, 60 plus years of precedence to regress specifically to harm black people and queer people. We're seeing institutions coordinate to create and or retread and back, back, back step, back pedal, backslide to challenge the very existence of entire groups of people. It's interesting in this moment, I think about this DEI leader I worked with, um, truly the biggest coward um, and incompetent person I've ever met. Uh, The most incompetent person I have ever met. And that was quickly uh, determined after a couple of months of us working together. But anyway, um, as time went on, they showed themselves to be increasingly incompetent, truly. And under this person's leadership before this company was acquired by another company, the black population was slashed by over 50% under this person's leadership. Now, when asked about it later, Because if you're still there, if you're still a black person at this company and half of your employee base is gone in six months, you're going to ask questions. So this person was asked, how is it that half of all of the black employees are gone? And the response was interesting. Their alleged response was. Everything we did was legal. Everything we did was legal. And I want y'all to be careful in this season of conflating legality with morality. That's a coward's answer in the face of outright oppression and exploitation. That's a coward's answer in the face of people being maligned, marginalized, and minimized. That is a coward's answer. And frankly, the answer and position of someone who is primarily focused with self-preservation. And I need you to understand something. This is really another yet another example of how the true work of diversity, equity, inclusion is not does not comport and is not 
compatible with a capitalist society or any type of capitalist context. Self-preservation cannot be your modus operandi in a position that is explicitly focused on equity and fairness. If you're only going to care about the, uh, the well-being of marginalized people and frankly, a fair experience for everybody, then you should not be in a role focused on diversity, equity, or inclusion or purpose, whatever other nonsense titles that y'all are creating for yourselves. You should not be in that position. I, I have to say that this is a season and a moment where we need to reprioritize justice. Now that is a scary word for a lot of y'all and I get it because justice, um, Justice implies consequences. Justice implies accountability and justice implies some degree of a large degree of righting past wrongs. We're in a season though, where it's going to be easy to say, well, this is legal. It is legal for me to ignore your humanity. It is legal for me to ignore the decades upon decades of institutional exploitation and instead act as if you need no additional support at all. Martin Luther King himself said law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice. And when they fail in this purpose, they become dangerously structured dams that block the law that block the flow of social progress. I want you to understand that that is where we are. That is where we are. We're in a place where we're seeing institutions strategically create dams that not only block progress, but revolt but reverse progress. We are. I I need y'all to understand that (laughs) this is not the season to say one thing to one audience and another, uh, another thing to another. This is the season to mean what you say. This is the season for your yes to be a yes and for your no to be a no. This is the season to push for justice, to be courageous, because irrespective of what the Supreme Court says, as they strip away bodily autonomy, human rights, irrespective of who the president may or may not be in this next election cycle, the people are moving in a different way and you DEI leader and you C-suite executive are going to be ultimately held accountable to the talent that you need to function. You are. And if you want to retain the talent that you have, and if you want to attract the talent that you need, and if you want to retain the consumers that you need, who make your products hot, by the way, that's black people and queer people. You're going to need to, to not be a coward. Another quote from Martin Luther King, never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. Slavery was legal, right? Everything. There's plenty of things that have been legal. Be careful. Be careful. Be mindful. You need to know that living corporate is who we are. All right. We came here centering and amplifying black and brown voices, and we ain't about to stop. We came here unapologetically centering black and brown, queer, disabled, non-binary, trans, 
immigrant, first generation voices, we're not going to stop. We exist. We exist because there's a reality that there are tons of spaces that center and amplify white people. That's why we don't do that. We want to center and amplify black and brown voices. And that's what we're going to continue to do. Because that's our purpose and that's our mission. Now, white people, as you know, if you're seeking to grow in your allyship, you're seeking to learn and, and be educated, then you're empowered to listen to this show. You're empowered to listen to all of our shows, read our blogs, check out our research. We have some, we have a platform launching really soon. You're empowered to check that out too. You're empowered to create a profile on living dash corporate.com. But let's be very clear. This platform will never change its mission and its purpose to center and amplify historically marginalized voices. This platform will never change its focus in calling out systems and structures that have historically harmed and marginalized black people and brown people and disabled people and queer people. We're never going to stop that. I need you also to know that your employees are watching in this moment. They're watching, they're observing, they're concerned. You're some of y'all are scared trying to figure out what y'all can do in light of the Supreme court rulings. And I'm telling you right now that your employees are already pre pissed off because they can sense your cowardice right now. Stop waiting and looking at what your peers are doing. Make a decision as to what you're going to do. You know, but this also goes back to like the reality that there's this argument that people try to make around diversity, equity, and inclusion and how it drives the bottom line. And people try to create these economic or capitalist arguments as to why seeing the humanity of black queer people or disabled immigrants or first generation professionals, why those things help you make more money. The reality is the studies have already been done. We know that, you know, that diversity, <laughs> equity, inclusion is profitable. The reality is, is that y'all don't want those dollars. That's the truth. That's the truth. Because there's something else in at play when it comes to stripping away a woman's bodily autonomy. There's something else at play when it comes to only targeting race based affirmative action, which was designed as a response to decades upon decades upon decades of institutions blocking black folks from jobs and education while taxing those same black folks to fund their institutions. And that something is power. The biggest fear that a lot of folks have here is losing power and money and power are not the same. They're not now they're related and one can influence other, but they're not the same. I know some of you black capitalists are probably shaking your head. Y'all disagree with me, but they're not money and power are not the same. I need for those who have a conscience and who are interested in retaining and attracting your talent to lean in, in a different way. And that's why I said this rapper, this intro, we call them rappers because it's the thing that you put around the conversation. It's a little bit of lingo. Anyway, it's going to be different. I, I, I need you to know, again, the landscape, where you're at in this, <laughs> what your employees are thinking about. And also, I want you to know where living corporate is at because we here. We here. We was here 
before we had these incredible brands that we work with. Shout out to all the brands. And we're going to be here uh, when they decide that living corporate is also illegal. <laughs> we're not going nowhere. All right. The last thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to read this, this, um, this quote from Dr. Ira Katz Nelson, who wrote this incredible book that I shouted out years ago, years ago, uh, called when affirmative action was white an untold history of racial inequality in the in 20th century America. Here's the quote. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying, now you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders as you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate them, bring him, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say, quote, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. We seek not just freedom from opportunity. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability, not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. Irrespective of where they lived, most white Americans before the civil rights era were indifferent to Jim Crow yet only in and surrounding the former Confederacy, the formal political system utilized race to exclude adults from citizenship and full access to civil society, private terror combined with public law and enforcement to make this political system authentically totalitarian competitive patty competitive party politics did not exist. Electoral contests were enacted inside the one dominant party. Those are just a couple of quotes from this incredible book. And, and the purpose of uh, this book, when affirmative action was right, I'll put the link in the show notes because it's a phenomenal. It's 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 very depressing. Let me say it's a, extremely sad, but it's an incredible body of research on how the New Deal and the GI Bill functioned to be affirmative action for white folks because the federal government did not enact the proper policies to make sure that the benefits of those bills actually reached black Americans because they wrote out those policies within the context of Jim Crow. It created one of the largest wealth dis uh, disparities in our modern era. Phenomenal read. And I can't really say it better than Dr. Kess Nelson. What I will say is it is a cruel deceit for the white majority to look up and say, all of a sudden, we're not thinking about race anymore. And I'm after there's been centuries and centuries of plunder and exploitation of black people and black bodies to build these ridiculous disparities we see in every measurable domain of our day-to-day -day human experience. Expect us to talk more about all of this and continue to grow increasingly impatient and increasingly blunt and radical in our framing and discussion around diversity, equity, inclusion, even if we don't use those words all the time. All right. Now, with all that being said, we're going to get into this conversation we had with Matt Stevenson. Phenomenal dialogue. I want to say thank you, Matt. God bless you. Uh, we will talk to y'all soon. Matt, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? I am fantastic, Zach. How about yourself? I'm doing well, man. Look, I'm so excited. We're finally going to get you on the show. You um, have a whole nonprofit called Code to College. Man, talk to me about Code to College in terms of where the name came from. Yep, absolutely. So uh, it's a funny story. My wife, she actually came up 
with the name after I came up with maybe about uh, 10 really bad names. And she just said, why not just call it Code to College? And, um, and, and that is how that ideation process went. And I just called her a genius like I do every day. Amen. Now, look, Code to College has been around for over six years now, right? Yep, that's right. Just over six. So, so y'all's primary audience are their their high school students, but at this point, you've had. I mean, it's been enough time, enough time to for to see a whole high school class go through. And depending on where you got some of your students at the very beginning, maybe even you have a couple folks about to graduate. Talk to me about when you knew that this this vision of yours was real. Yeah. So. Um... So, yes, you're correct. We actually have a handful, and that's going to continue to compound year over year, of our original high school students who have now graduated from college. But this all started uh, back in fall of 2016. Um, I, I've got a background in finance and information systems myself, and, and that really came because um, one of the, the elders in, our, in the church where I grew up when I was about to graduate from high school said, do something in computers. I didn't know what she meant. I don't know that she knew what she meant, but I ended up, uh, it ended up changing my life because having that skill set allowed me to significantly defray my college expenses. I had a number of um, coding related jobs and projects that I worked on over the course of, of undergrad. Um, it helped me uh, set myself apart once I graduated as well. And I realized that there was something here that um, that having a skill set in coding, um, which already had such low barriers to entry, could unlock just enormous potential economically, professionally, um, and personally. And so when we moved here uh, to the Austin area about, at this point, seven years ago, um, looked around and said, this is it. You've got this incredible tech hub. You've got the Metas, you've got the Googles, you've got the um, the Indies, the Atlassians um, here in town and, and roughly about 3,000 plus startups. But then you've got this community of historically underestimated, i.e. black, brown, economically disadvantaged students who live a stone's throw away from these companies, but would probably never expect that they could work there, let alone as an engineer. And so started to pound the pavement, do a little bit of, um, uh, or a lot of uh, ecosystem analysis to understand who's here in the landscape. Are there gaps that are not being addressed? And I found that there were. And so started making the rounds at tech meetups. Uh, if you're familiar with Austin, walking up and down Congress Avenue to different uh, tech companies and just pitching and saying, hey, look, I'd like to teach high school students who look like me how to code, give them some professional skills and see what we can do there. And um, and we got a handful of volunteers involved at that point. But after the first year or at the end of the first year, we were able to place two of those high school students into uh, software engineering internships with Indeed. And both of them got return offers. And at that point I said, we've got something here. We're, we're about to build a track record and a, a solid program off of this pilot. I love that, man. So, like, let's talk a little bit more about, like, just the landscaping of coding. So, I'm about to ask some questions, like, from a I'm, my background is not coding. My background is uh, change management, human resources, diversity, inclusion, consulting, things of that nature. More so, like, on the people strategy side. Like, I, the t I really admire and am intrigued by, like, just the technical uh, knowledge that goes into coding. Um, here's my question. As I think about the future mm -hmm. of, like... The tech space a lot of the coding that I, I've seen be taught in terms of like just the basic coding I've also heard that there are going in like the next five years there's going to be tools that's going to be able to do that level of coding and so like ultimately that again like just tech as a space is going to continue to advance and that coding will continue to advance and be more complex and that um, some folks posit that it's about really understanding larger systems and not necessarily just typing lines of code. My question to you is, what does it look like to make sure that as you up, as we're upskilling the future in this space, that they don't become like the equivalent of like bricklayers? You know what I'm saying? Like, what does it look like to make sure that 
they are enabled or empowered to take on um, higher work as they get into the tech space. So um, I'm going to I'm going to say something and it's probably going to be controversial, but, um, you know, our name is Code to College for a reason. It's because we truly do believe that having an undergraduate degree is it remains one of the most critical um, assets, but usually gatekeeping um, check check marks for for people and not even just people but I mean in particularly in in particular uh, disenfranchised and underestimated populations and so um, irrespective of what many of these major tech companies say of if you can code you don't need a college degree the question that I always ask when a hiring manager says that to me is okay well so what are the qualifications that you need to advance what are the qualifications that you need to move out of the software engineering or software development team? And it continues to be a bachelor's. So you might not need a, a, a college degree to code, but they're going to say that you need a college degree to be on the marketing team, but you need a college degree to enter program management, but you need a college degree to manage the other devs. And so um, I'm not saying that a college degree infers um, actual potential or competency, but I will say that it continues to be a barrier and that, that is, it is one of the things that will continue to unlock that access. That said, I'm also a proponent of um, on, on, on the merits of an undergraduate degree. There's a tremendous amount of access that, that you are afforded. Um, you do get to um, access the undergraduate alumni network. You also get to take advantage of the fact that, again, I think to your to your detriment in many cases, you're seen as a known quantity. You know, someone being able to say, "I'm familiar with that school. Um, I'd love to have you on board," or I, "I'm an, I'm a fellow alum, so I'd love to welcome you onto our team." Those are some of the benefits um, of having a degree. Um, I would say outside of that, it's it's continuing to be self-driven in your learning process. Now, a college degree isn't for everyone. Not everyone wants to attain one, and that's that's absolutely fine. I would say those folks who try to become specialists in one particular tech stack or language, those are the ones who are most at risk of being pigeonholed and, you know, as you refer to them as bricklayers. If you're continuing to push yourself to learn new languages, new skill sets, new frameworks, um, asking questions, then you will never be obsolete. I love that. Um, let's talk a little bit more about just like your students, right? Like what is it, li what is it like to, or what is your journey and your approach to building up the community of students that you have within code to college? What does it look like to, to track their, um, their, their success or their movement as they go to college? And like, what is like, what, what are, what are some of the data points that you really hang your hat on? Absolutely. So um, I love the question about how do we build them up? Uh, mentorship is a key part of our program model. We have, I was just on a call today with a prospective partner and there are at least five different mentorship specific. We've got about a dozen volunteer roles, but we've got at least five volunteer opportunities for um, for our partners. And it's everything from an engagement of, of once, um, you know, once per workshop to an ongoing relationship with, you know, high school as well as our um, college going students where you've got monthly check-ins, where you've got uh, the opportunity. They have the opportunity to reach out by phone or by text message or by email um, for any questions that they might have about their academic experience, their professional experience. We've got about 150 of our high school students this summer alone who are in these paid software engineering internships. And they each of them have anywhere from three to five mentors. They've got a code to college mentor. They've got a code to college staff member who they can call on. They've got um, a mentor and a manager at work. Um, and the mentor is typically somebody that um, does not have direct management relationship, but can help provide additional context and color for the, their employer. 
Um, and so mentorship is a key part of the work that we do. Um, we, we truly build them up through many of these experiences. They are, um, they're oftentimes focused on um, specific deliverables. So we have a workshop that we host several times a year focused on resume building. One of the things that we, we do to prepare our volunteers for this is positive narration. Now, as a high school student, I didn't have a resume. You know, I don't know if you had a resume. I, I certainly did not have a resume. And if I did, it would it would have looked like trash, to be honest. And well, but the positive, uh, we, we of course wouldn't say that to a student. We, we talk about the positive narration and identify what are they doing well? You know, something something that comes up absolutely every time for our young ladies is I don't have any professional experience. You know, I, I don't have anything to put on here. We ask, well, you know, have you ever babysat? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I babysit. You know, I've been babysitting for the last couple of years. That's work experience. That's fantastic. Tell me more about that experience. Well, uh, I, I started out by babysitting for this one family. Now it's, it's about three or four families, but I can't do all three or four. So I brought in a friend of mine and I collect the money. But I, it's like, you're an employer. You're, you, didn't, you don't just have professional experience, but you're, you're creating jobs. Like that's, that's powerful, not only to in, include on your resume, but for you to talk about when you're in that interview, when you are writing a scholarship essay, when you're writing a college admissions essay, these are all great experiences for you to tease out. And that's just another way that we, we work with our volunteers and with our staff to make sure that we are building up our students and, and letting them see how much potential that they have that they don't even recognize. Um, in terms of, you know, data that I, I really hang my hat on is our team has been able to uh, maintain a solid return offer rate of 85% for our high school interns. And by that, I mean, they go through this high school internship as, you know, a 15, 16, 17 year old, and the employer asks them to come back the following summer. So they are asking high school interns to come back because they said, you actually delivered value. Because anybody can hire a high school intern, right. right? And say, well, you know, we did something nice for the community. But if you continue to do that and you ask for even more interns from our program over the time, that means that our interns are doing a great job. The Code to College team is doing a great job in preparing them as well. Another thing um, I'm very proud of is the fact that over the last six years, we've served over 2,500 students. Those first three years, uh, it was me solo, you know, one employee, one FTE. And uh, we only started bringing on employees the last three years. And so, you know, something that I've, I've heard on on your podcast before is, you know, uh, black people, we, we, we do a lot with a little and, <laughs> and 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 had to manage to do a lot with a little being, you know, the the, the chief fundraiser, the chief fundraising officer, the chief program officer, the chief you know, executive officer wearing these many hats. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of what we've been able to build. We've got just over 30 employees today. So those are just a couple of the things I could go on, but I know you got other questions. Man, you know, it's, it's interesting, man. You know, as we talk about like, just like this, this, this space, Code to College, you're engaging the next generation of workers and really preparing them for, uh, for higher education, but then also for the workforce. Talk to me about some of the patterns you're seeing when it comes to just like dealing with and engaging Gen Zers, man. Like, what is that like? And Frank, I, and some of these really, maybe they're not even Gen Zers because Gen Zers are now they're in they're in the workforce now. But again, like these folks that you're that you're serving in the next ten years, they're going to be Frank experienced professionals. Talk to me about yeah. some of the the themes that you're noticing as you as they matriculate through your program. Yeah, some of the themes uh, that I'm seeing is that they are highly relational. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, we have employers who, uh, or prospective employers, excuse me, who will say, uh, Matt, this, this sounds like a great program, but I'm trying to convert. You know, um, for most people, if they, if, they, if they don't know, I'll share that. Companies use internships as a conversion tool and a hiring tool. Typically, they will they will hire or make offers to um, successful undergraduate interns um, after a summer. And these are folks who are going back to college for their senior year. So the following summer, they would start full time. Now, that makes the prospect of a high school intern 
uh, less appealing because you're effectively moving from a time frame of one year that they'd have to wait to see them again to six or seven years, right? And so what I've said is, look, the data speaks for itself. You might have to have a longer time horizon, but you will surely have a great deal more uh, employer loyalty or, excuse me, employee loyalty amongst this generation because they say, look, you've invested in me when I I was too young to convert to FTE. I know that. You invested in me when I was probably taking up a significant amount of time of the engineering manager that I was working with, the team who had to spend a little bit more time coaching me, and they end up staying. They actually end up coming back year after year after year. We're this coming summer, or excuse me, this coming year, we're going to have our very first code to college participant graduate from college. And she has been with Indeed for the last six years. Imagine how dangerous she is after having been invested in for six years. She knows the organization. She knows her division. She knows her team. She knows the stack, right? They're a Java shop over at Indeed. She knows the projects. And she's not even going to come in at a level one. Level one being typically a a software developer. They're typically, uh, there are five levels. She's not going to come in at a level one, which most hires, most devs you're hiring, you're, you're probably going to hire at level one, level two. She's probably going to come in at a level three. Wow. And she's, and she's a Latina and she's first generation and she's, and she's, she's just brilliant. And she is just one of the, the many students that we've served to date. And so I would say relationships are, are, are important. They want to understand that you are investing in them um, and that this is not just a sort of a transactional engagement. And then the other thing is they want to know that they're making an impact. You know, this this generation and I even think the, the prior generation, they, they don't want to show up to a job uh, because it just pays the bills. And so any company trying to compete on salary premiums will lose because <laughs> there, there's always going to be another company that can pay more. So they want to know that the work that they're doing is meaningful. They want, they need to hear. So you need to over communicate how it's meaningful as well. It is 2022 when we're recording this, we're in the middle of a bunch of stuff, right? Between economic uh, turmoil and anxiety, political landscape. Uh, The world is on fire, literally and metaphorically. Um, And, uh, and folks are in the middle of losing their rights left and right. Like let's talk a little bit about what does it look like for you to encode to college more broadly to, to maintain not just relationships with the students, but the parents of those students, especially as life can start pulling, potentially pulling them away or out of the program. Yeah, this is a, this is one that we, so I um I've done a I've done a number of things in my in my professional career. You know I I started out as an analyst at Goldman. Um, I've I've been uh, a program manager for um, for an internship program for undergrads, um, but I've also been a teacher. And one of the things I learned early on is that you know parents are partners, or at least they need to be. If if you don't look at parents as partners. Um, within the education space, um, you're going to lose, right? They see them or they have them in their care for, you know, upwards of 50, 60% of the week. And so if you cannot see them as partners and engage with them as such, um, you, you don't, you don't stand a chance. And so one of the ways that we try to make sure that our, our parents are engaged is, is to keep them aware. We have a parent newsletter that we circulate to let them know of the the benefits of our programming. Um, we're we're in the midst of, of beefing that up. We just hired a manager of storytelling who is um, fantastic. Um, huge shout out to her. But we're looking to bolster that significantly. We also have a team member who we we just promoted um, to to run our school engagement, and he's also going to beef up the the communication. That's that's one of the things that. I, I, I believe firmly that we've unfortunately lost in this new mostly virtual world is, is communication. We all, um, you know, for better or worse, are using social media as our method typically of staying engaged and, and, um, and informed. 
And that means that we're hearing from the masses, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not um, making genuine connections and, and hearing from those who are who are truly in our network. So um, we're trying to change that. We're trying to make sure that um, all of our stakeholders hear from us and understand the state of affairs, our program offerings, and also that we're soliciting feedback from them. Um, they want to feel um, invested and that their input is being heard. And so I will say that we, um, we solicit feedback from our students on a, uh, on a routine basis. Um, and by routine, I mean every class they get a survey. We ask them, how's your instructor doing? Would you give them a high five at the end of this class? But, well, as virtual and the sterile high five, right? These days and times. But, you know, um, what, what, what additional feedback do you have for us? But we also have a beginning and end of wave survey. So we can understand how to re refine and reform the work that we do. Um, and, and we do the same thing with our volunteers as well. So, man. So, you know, again, it's 2022 and recording this. Let's look up. Let's, let's imagine the future. It's 2030. Um, what is code to college doing and what are you most proud of looking back? Yeah. Uh, so 2030, uh, code to college should have, uh, resolved, or at least actively um, mitigated the last mile uh, challenge. And by that, I mean, today we operate mostly in second tier cities. So, you know, we're based here in Austin, um, but we've got programming in Minneapolis, in Detroit, in Philly. Um, these are cities that, you know, while many of them may not ha necessarily have the same resources as a New York or a Bay area, um, they do have a corporate presence and therefore they are afforded many more resources than, you know, say Saginaw, Michigan, or, you know, you know, uh, Mississippi Delta. Um, and so we, what we want to do in the long term is be able to offer code to college programming to any student, irrespective of your zip code, irrespective of your proximity to a corporate, um, a corporate entity and ensure that you have what you need to be successful especially if you want to enter the STEM workforce. Um, I would also say that my, um, my goal is that we are not just this huge organization. I mentioned before that we've got roughly about 30 uh, employees right now. I would hate for, I, I think I did it wrong if in eight years we have 300 people employed uh, by Code to College and we're just larger, right? And we're, we're just serving... Uh, you know, like a couple thousand more students. I mean, that is not scaling. That's growing. The difference is with scaling, we're doing it with quality. We're doing it in a sustainable way. We're doing it in a way that um, we're able to leverage network effects. And and again, you said in 2030, that's eight years from now. <laughs> at that point, at, at that point, Code to College has been around for almost 15 years. 15 years. I'm not saying that we will have solved the problem, but we should have a very different composition of our tech ecosystem with people who look like you and me and some of the young ladies that we're serving who are in, in uh, positions of power and influence and that they are making a lot of the decisions to ensure that we can have a brighter future. Man, I love it. I love the fact that you know, your vision sounds transformational, right? Like you said, it's not like, hey, we just want to be bigger. And I'm learning, man, it's like I talk to people who have these spaces and they're doing things like this, right, where like their their um, their charter or their mission um, is really around, ben supposedly around benefiting black and brown kids um, or supporting um, historically marginalized spaces. But then like when you peel back the layers, it's like, oh, this is just a, this is just a money play for you. Like all of the stuff on the front is to look good, but you don't actually care about necessarily changing your, like shifting the environment. You actually would like for things to stay the same so you could profit off of it. Um, and that's been weird. Like to kind of like, as you, as I have conversations with people um, in our, in our spaces, Matt, like in private, like behind the scenes, it's like, Oh, like you're not really trying to like actually like create or change, like make any type of systemic change. You're just trying to make money. Um, this has been a com dope conversation, Matt. Like we could go on. F I feel like we go on forever. Um, but but let me let me end it here asking you this question, man. Um, we're in this year. I actually look in the future. I'm asking you to look just a little bit shorter time frame, though. Between now 
and 2023, like the next year, summer 2023, what are you most excited about? So we are we are launching an initiative called the the next 3000. And so, you know, over the last six years, I mentioned that we served uh, 2500 uh, students. We placed about 250 of them into those uh, high school internships. And we're we're about to enter the next phase of growth where we're focused on serving 8000 more students and placing 3,000 of them into these paid summer internships because those internships are really a lever for change, um, economic, uh, economically, professionally, personally. Um, you know the old saying of teach a man to fish. I was on a I was on a call the other day with a with a partner who uh, or a prospective partner who said, you know, um, how do you financially support your students? And I said, you know. We do absolutely have some scholarship opportunities and there's some book stipends that we offer, but we firmly believe that the, the, the greatest impact we have is that we are teaching them these marketable skills. You know, it's, it's the exact same thing. I mean, the way that I was able to pay off, you know, thousands of dollars of my tuition and, of you know, I didn't have room and board. I was, a, I was an RA. So shout out to RAs and that opportunity. But I mean, that that's the key is the skills. And it, it goes right back to what I mentioned earlier about, you know, ensuring that, you know, folks are don't become bricklayers and are out of a job in a few years after the specific skill set that they learned, you know, is, is no longer used. It's we want to encourage students to learn these skills and then to continue to be lifelong learners after that. And so a year from now, I'm looking to serve 500 or place 500 more of these high school interns. I'm looking for us to have our systems even firmer in place because as we continue to grow um, as a startup, we need to make sure that we're taking care of our people appropriately. And, you know, most of all, I, I, I would say on a personal note, looking to spend more time with my family. Matt, man, I'm so glad we were able to have you on the show. It's been incredible. Um, I'm so excited about code to college as I think about just, all the work that y'all are doing and the impact that you're having, not just on those kids' lives, but like the kids, those families, right? Like you're touching, there's hundreds of people that you're that you're touching that you'll never even meet, right? Um, hell, thousands, but I'm talking about hundreds just between like that one kid. So, uh, man, I appreciate you. You're a friend of the show. Man, I hope you feel comfortable coming back anytime. Would love to. So grateful for the invite. Zach, what you're doing is amazing, and I cannot wait for us to do more work together. I love it, man. We'll talk soon. Peace. And we're back. Shout out to Matt. Shout out to the team. Take care of yourselves. Honor yourselves. And remember... The people that you need are watching. Love y'all. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.